Okay, we're back today. Today we're going to talk about human intention and the power of human intention uh, scientifically through scientific means uh, with Dr. Nisha and Mark. And we're going to explore this uh, thing about human intention and science, uh, the Buddha relics, and just continue the discussion that where we left off last time. What we're talking about last time was the fact that <clears throat> this uh, Dr. Tiller was measuring the, like a field or of an information or some kind of, uh, I guess, power coming from the Buddha relics. And he was doing it scientifically through, sci through, through some kind of device or some kind of measurement. So we talked about that at length in the previous video. So today we're going to talk about some other things and we'll start off with intention. So Dr. Nisha. Thank you. Good to see you. Hi, Mark in New York City, and good morning to you, Bante, in Thailand. Well, you know, um, the Buddha relics and Tiller's work really is the nexus between science and spirit. I mean, Tiller's work really explains the phenomena of the relics, which is so incredible, because without his work, it was really a struggle for me to understand that, first of all, that consciousness survives, well, first of all, physical death, okay? And that consciousness is encapsulated with very high Buddha masters in these objects we call ring cell that survive for a long, long time. Now, what was it, 3,000 years now? But what Tiller really did was this, and, and this, this work he did was at uh, Stanford University. I want to give you a little background of Bill Tiller himself. Tiller was a mathematician, a physicist, and a material scientist. And he also very unusually was a Rishi. A Rishi is a Sanskrit word for a sage. And since I think the early 70s, he was meditating every day. Okay. This is really incredible for somebody of this stature to meditate and do his connect conventional signs together. So he understood the subtle energies. He could feel them. He said Qigong and Tai Chi, when you do that, or yoga or meditation, you're really doing something on the acupuncture and chakra systems. Now in medicine, we don't have those sorts of systems or dialogue, but for Tiller, he was very familiar that you have to understand energy. And for him, thermodynamics are the laws that helps us tie in uh, coherence, entropy. And when you do um, in thermodynamics, the biggest factor is entropy or disorder. And when you introduce order, which you do with human intention, our consciousness gives order to something, then you get energy. It's a source of free energy. So when you reduce entropy, you give Gibbs free energy in a very big nutshell. And what Tiller did in his intention experiments was, can my intention actually impact a material thing out there without my touching it? without my addition of any chemicals. That's extraordinary because now he's touching on consciousness. Consciousness works by intention. That's the tool. You don't need brain MRI. You're really going to a very fundamental principle of what we call consciousness. And consciousness works by intention. And intention is a process of creation. You can write an equation. You can do a painting. You can do something that endures in physical reality. So he actually wrote an intention out. He wrote it out in a physics language that my intention will change material object. In this case, pH of water. Hydrogen ions will go up by a factor of 10 or reduced by a factor of 10. He was very specific. And then he's meditative. The next step was, you cannot hold an intention and hold an intention to change the pH of water because we don't know if the protocol would work. 
And this is where his genius comes in, in my view. We know that human intention can impact a physical object in a measurable way. It, it imprints it. That information of his intention written out and holding it in his consciousness, just very focused, would imprint in an object, in an electrical object. It was that object then that you switch on and it is transmitting that information, coherent information, 24-7 to the target. That target is being measured by the pH meter, okay? It was very fine information. This is not a litmus paper now. You're talking very fine 0 0.001 pH units. And he found initially there was a delay of several weeks. But as he kept rep reproducing this pH water experiments, it became faster. And, fa and it always went in line with his intention. And that's fascinating because remember, there's no contact between you, the intention holder, and the target. That's the first thing to say. Secondly, it seems that subtle energy information goes from this box, you might say, or object, imprinted object, to the target. So we can say that nature itself has other avenues of information transfer. It's not electromagnetic. It's not like a telephone wire or me touching something. Okay, it's not physical. It's not electromagnetic. So nature has other ways of transferring that information in a very coherent way to the target. And the target receives it and then has a measurable change. Now, when Tiller did this over and over again, not just with water, but he did it with human enzymes and then a living system fruit fly, again, changing the fruit fly, living system life cycle in a measurable way. When he was doing this, he noticed something. When you do thermodynamic experiments, you have to, understand the ambient conditions in the lab itself. And he was monitoring that all the time. And he noticed something. He was, no, he was measuring the ambient temperature, the, uh, the water temperature, and he was noting very rhythmic cycles. Literally like, uh, this was not circadian rhythms, this was not air currents. He did all kinds of things. This is, is this air temperature, that is the air molecules themselves. And he put a fan. Actually, my air condition just kicked into gear here in California. And he did that. You can put a fan, you can do um, measurement of temperature morning, evening, all throughout in Arizona. He was in Arizona when, when he was doing some of these. It was not air currents. It was always rhythmic. You put a fan in the lab, still rhythmic. If it was air currents, when the fan is switched on, the paper would fly off just like that. The air currents should, the, the, the rhythmic would disturb the measurement systems, but it didn't. So what were these things that were so rhythmic in the lab? And this is what is so fascinating he realized human intention is just tickling, you might say, the physical vacuum, the empty space, because there's no air molecules there. And this, we're coming into Paul Dirac's work. Paul Dirac was the British quantum physicist who coined the term physical vacuum or empty space. And from the empty space, when you have enough cosmic energy is where you get material stuff. So Tiller reasoned that we're getting closer or we're tickling the first layer of the physical vacuum, which is field effects. This is the field, all right? So I'm gonna stop there for a moment so that you can ask me questions because I could keep talking. 
Bonte, do you have questions? Hmm. Yeah, I'm just just letting that all sink in. Okay. Just letting that all sink in. There, you know, there's a few little things there um, that are quite interesting. That uh, you know, I'm kind of marveling um, um, that you know, a scientist would actually go to this length to try to. And I mean, he's, he's quite intelligent too, quite quite creative in trying to find out, like what is there, what is there between, you know, the human being and the external object, and how can a thought process affect that external object, right? So, and how is that transmitted? Is it transmitted through the air, through the water, through 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 molecules? How is that done? And he was he was trying to find this out. If if I if if I've understood correctly, right? Yes. So, so 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 yeah, that's that's fascinating in itself, you know, because there's not a lot of people who would be <laughs> who would be uh, intrigued by such a thing. Um, but in fact, this tells us th this kind of science is really important because it leads to understanding uh, the human capability uh, much more. Than just you know taking a stimulant or uh, you know uh, all, all the, the the sensual desires that we tend to cling and crave to, but mm -hmm. it shows that there's much more. In fact, uh, one thing, two things that come to mind while you were talking was uh, a senior teacher once said to me that uh, you know thoughts are very powerful, and when the mind becomes more and more concentrated, when you become more and more still. And as the Buddha talks at the fourth jhana, when the mind becomes very, very steady, really steady, 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 it becomes almost laser-like. Yes. Right? At yes. that point, you know, and then you could argue whether that's Samatha or Vipassana or whatever, if you want to go down that road. But let's just stick to this one, this steady one-pointed mind. In other words, the, the chitta converges completely. It's no longer distracted. It's harnessing all its uh, ability, capability, and power within itself. It's staying completely and utterly focused, mm -hmm. right? At this point, right, there's no tools that can measure that kind of power. And this kind of science is going in that direction. It's touching on it. It's touching on right? it. And now you, you, you bring up a point that's very important because I've mentioned that Tiller was a meditator. And, you know, when I began my meetings with him, I quickly realized that you do not call Tiller at 3 p.m. Between 3 p.m. and 4.30, he would be meditating. And this was a very consistent practice for years and years. So you are right. He was not a light bulb of a thought where you have a destructive interference as the light comes out. The light is there. Okay. He was laser. He was a laser. Okay. And laser is marvelous. It's coherent light, all in phase. And when he would imprint, this is another thing I just want to mention, because I was with him in, in, in imprinting sessions where you hold an intention. He would say, we, we would go into silence for several minutes. You feel the, you feel the space. You just, when you go into meditation, you close your eyes, you focus and you go into your heart and you just be in the chair. It was no fancy posture, it was in the chair. And then he would ring out this intention, may the indwelling consciousness of the target, whatever he would specify. And then you hold that intention, thy will be done. Yeah. Thy will be done. That means show me the truth in this statement. Show me the truth that this protocol is correct and true and then you go into silence once again and this is it 30 minutes to 45 minutes and it's a sense of completion you feel a sense of completion of that imprinting process now this device would be kept on a table where about three or four people were sitting around it including tiller including tiller and when he was at Stanford doing this imprinting experiment, he was very clear about one thing. Every one of his graduate students pretty much were yogis. When I say yogis, they had to be meditators. And in fact, when I 
proposed that I would join his team, that he would teach me this uh, science that he had discovered, he said, I will not take you on into my team unless you meditate. It wasn't even I had no funding, it, it, you know, I wasn't bothered by that. But when he said, I want you to meditate, this was really striking to me. Okay, so he put that inner management first and central to his whole protocol and his teammates. And that's really important. Not only himself, but his wife, Jean Tiller, were meditators. And that's why I call him a Rishi. He absolutely knew mathematics and knew the excellence of science, but he was also excellent internally. Okay, he could hold a single intention for 30 minutes. I would tell you that when a couple of the times I was with him, he turned to me at the end of the session and said, you're not there. I, I, could, I can sense your agitation almost, you know, Nisha drifts off and drifts back and he could feel that. He could feel that. And uh, actually I had to then stop meditating with that team because I could disturb the field. The space was the clue. The physical vacuum does not have any stuff in it. And he could see that when that lab space was in this rhythmic harmonics, because you could take that tracing of the temperature in the water and do Fourier analysis. It's a mathematical technique where you can take those tracings and you get amplitudes, okay? And you can see that there is nesting amplitudes of the air temperature, the water temperature, the pH measurements really nesting perfectly. And in ordinary reality, you do not see that. It was as though he said this beautifully. He said, the whole lab was pumping and singing together. Right, every corner of that space was in sync, okay? And you do not see that in ordinary reality because you, you switch on a fan and the air condition would start pumping, everything would just be flying off, but he didn't do that. So this lab space was, as he called it, conditioned. It wasn't ordinary reality anymore. It was the next step up. He called it U1 gauge and SU2 gauge. And you can do mathematics in this, okay? There's SU2, SU3, SU4, and on up. But the relics are devices that set the space where they're exhibited to a very high level of conditioning. When they came to my home, in Los Angeles, an ordinary living room was not ordinary anymore. And it was in seconds. Tiller took weeks to months to have a conditioning of his lab space to the next level. The relics are devices with a half-life of 3,000 plus years that hold this love and boom, I'm, I'm serious, within seconds, the light bulbs went, our toaster went, okay? It bust with the sheer amount of energy. I'm using the word energy, but really it's subtle energy because this is loving kindness. And we made it clear in the previous uh, talk in number three, where Bante made the point, this is not smooch, smooch, lovey, lovey, no, lovey, dovey stuff. No, we're talking about the heart center. This is unconditional loving kindness at work. And you can quantify that. You can put a number on it. And Tiller found that with the pH of water experiments, every time the pH went up one unit, this is like several hundred degrees centigrade, like the room was burning up. But the lab space was not in fire. The lab space was not on fire. So what is this? If well, it's I not have an answer. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. So are you familiar with the uh, Buddha Ava Tamsaka Sutra? I know of some of the suttas, but 
It sounds familiar, but I don't know it in detail. Tell so, us yeah. the, the Buddha Avatamsaka Sutra, it's like this huge volume. But essentially, the Tibetans, the, 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 the Tibetan version of the Sutra, they basically call it like the cosmic blueprint, or it's it basically describes how world systems are exist, mm -hmm. and that we live in a world system, but there's also world systems within world systems, and within this world system, it is all you can have direct intent intention and then indirect attention and they all can affect each other within the different world systems so they call it a chilia which is like it like an undescribably long of uh, world systems within world systems and this is why like when the buddha can pick a flower and say that on the tip of the on the on the on the on the this flower contains all the world systems you will ever need mm -hmm. because it's it's the symbology of the world system within world systems within world systems and how my intention whether it be direct or indirect all has its influences yes so the tibetans turn to this particular document this uh the ava tamsaka sutra and they basically are are saying that this is like a group a blueprint of co of quantum physics mm -hmm. of how you can affect one thing here and its immediate response is can be inches away miles away or universes away instantaneously yes because of the world systems. So you can also create a separate world system within a world system through intention. And yes. this is what what the Tibetans like to do when they have their big ceremonies. You know, and they got the whole thing going. And the horns, the singing, and everything. You feel as if you are not in the world system that you lived in. You're in a different world system. You feel that you, you, you could, whether you are in the space or walk into the space or even walk out of the space, mm -hmm. you feel a difference. You say, that is a different universe over there. I don't, this universe that I call my normal life or world where my car is parked, my house is, that's in a different world system, but over here is completely different. It's another you. Your mind tells you it's a different universe. Mm -hmm. And so some, the some laws, of the, yeah, yeah. Go the ahead. The laws, the laws of physics, the laws of time, the laws of a lot of things, um, tend to bend or they distort or warp. But this is what the Tibetans were talking about, when, especially when they're talking about Tibetan sciences, is all based on this one document that I was telling you about, the Avatamsaka Sutra, that describes how these world systems come into being, how they're destroyed, and how they reemerge again, all through direct and indirect intentions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and so what I found with Tiller's work very fascinating is that there are realms in a lab. There's this reality and there's this reality and there's more. You're right. But he could describe the conditioned space, which is just next to ordinary reality, reality. And we can access that. This is the whole point to me, that we can create this conditioned spaces bless you mark um in a clinic in a hospital in a healing space or yoga studio we have the capacity to create very good high healing spaces i hope you're okay mark <laughs> but but there's also one other thing if if i may say about the physical vacuum and you mentioned quantum physics 
quantum physics is the physics of the microscopic, the atom molecule. And then we have the cosmos. And you have, you know, this cosmos and, and quantum theory. How do we reconcile the two? Well, in um, Princeton, uh, Wheeler, John Wheeler, did calculations where you can reconcile the two very different mathematics to calculate the latent energies in the physical vacuum, because the vacuum is the most abundant state. The chair I'm sitting on now and the computer screen or whatever I have is mostly empty space. Now, most people agree with it. And it's the attraction between atoms and molecules that make things seem solid. So if you calculate the vacuum latent energy, as John Wheeler did, a single hydrogen atom molecule, the empty space between the, the nucleus and the single electron is, is equivalent to 15 billion light years cosmos. I mean, your fingertip can light all of Chicago, okay? I'm just giving a like a funny analogy, but the, the energy in one single hydrogen atom, I mean, just imagine, okay? So when these relics that are holding the conscious intention of Buddha is a very high field, that energy is, and we, we actually measured it, okay? So in other words, every pH unit up, you get free energy because it's coherent information from the relics that is conditioned that space, okay? And we did this work. If, if I can just share, um, I'm going to actually, hold on. I'm going to share my screen because I want to bring up a, a graph. We'll let this go We'll let this load. Sorry. I'm going to scroll down because what we're saying here is that the Buddha relics on the left here and Tiller's device are really the parallel because the relics were in a container, the stupa container. It is wrapped and protected in a relic case. And in a car, in a van, we used to call it the relic van, it's transported from city to city for exhibitions. Tiller device is a device, a plastic box. After imprinting, it was wrapped and protected with a foil and sent to a lab for, in a FedEx plane, for the experiment. So you can see their parallels here. And then we have this ordinary living room become like this. And we know those spaces are very special. We've looked at these pictures before, okay? Many pictures like this exist. So this is it. We have conventional physics in the very left here, you engage. This is ordinary reality. This is our hospitals. This is normal science labs. They can never get consciousness effects until they are conditioned. They have to go higher into that field effect. And I'll tell you, Buddha relics is much higher. It's much higher. Why do I say that? Because I took tiller boxes and put them under the table of the relic, Buddha relics, to imprint them to imprint the tiller devices with the unconditional loving kindness of the Buddha relics. And I said to tiller, here you are. And he agreed, he says, we should test this out because if you feel subjectively that the field in your home was magnitudes different and higher, and I used to go to his lab and I said, your labs are different, okay? You feel relaxed. You feel like you're in a sacred space, and yet there are all these computers and ticker tapes and electronic things going on. And he says, yeah, you know, this space is not ordinary anymore because my intention and all of my team's intention are always working, and it is higher space. So we, I gave him the box imprinted by the Buddha relics, and guess what happened? We put next to a pH meter with the pH, and the idea is 
that the Buddha relic imprinted device would take that unconditioned space quickly up, okay, with the pH meter, we could, we could calculate the thermodynamics of that space. And this is what happened. Nothing happened here, okay, nothing happened. Literally for weeks, and he called me, Tiller, he says, Nisha, the protocol isn't working. And I was really disappointed, and I said, but I know what I felt in my home. And we know that your protocol works. So what's what's the matter here? And then it, it occurred to me that Tiller is, U1 gauge is ordinary. He is just tickling at SU2, but the relics of Buddha are much higher. They're not SU3 or SU4. This is, this. they're probably SU90. I'm, I'm just saying, we, we don't know. But we need to communicate that to the relic device, the imprinted box, to manifest its excess energy in a measurable way in the room that we were doing the experiment. And that's what Tiller wrote, okay? He wrote this intention, and I'll read it out. We respectfully request this excess thermodynamic free energy aspect of loving kindness essence be made manifest in this space so we can experimentally measure its thermodynamic magnitude while the active pH sensors present in this space. Okay, so he respectfully requested the Buddha masters to manifest the pH meter to uh, record. And look at what happened. This is when that request was made. We were having no effect before, and then it took off, literally like a rocket. This is over two weeks. And, and Tiller was very excited and I went, oh my goodness. Because remember, this was a box, a Tiller device, in the room of the Buddha relics. And once you talk to it, it's a conscious object. It's behaving consciously and manifesting that excess energy. This energy in thermal terms would take a temperature change of 700 degrees to produce a thermodynamic effect. I mean, the pH just went up. We actually, after two weeks, actually switched it off. We said, okay, it works, okay. It could have kept going on, I think. And the Buddha relic imprinted uh, intention host device shows a robust physical space conditioning. That room, that experimental lab space that was unconditioned, we plugged it in, we had to wait, nothing was happening. And once Tiller said, wait, can we respectfully manifest the excess thermodynamic energy in the space? And then it did. It's like the Buddha masters answered Tiller, okay? And so... Well, so, on that point, uh, so people don't think we're flying too, you know, too, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, into the uh, abstract. Um, the Buddha uh, said many, many times that if one points the mind to something, one can one can achieve it. Like, for example, if one says, you know, next life I want to be reborn in heaven, in this particular heaven, or, or in this life I want this particular thing. Now, we're talking about the Buddha's standard of focus. We're not talking about ordinary focus because this gets yes. confused all the time. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Buddha's standard of setting the mind to something. That means that when you set the mind to something, you really are not distracted and you're really staunch in that intention, right, and focus. So the Buddha talks about that a lot. The other thing that comes to mind is the, the eight jhanas, uh, because here we're talking about samadhi or concentration, and the eight jhanas was, is not a Buddhist thing. Jhanas are not Buddhist. Jhanas are just jhanas, right? So um, it's the jhanas are levels of concentration i suppose if you want to call it level or just for the sake of communication they're just eight jhanas 
Now, for for wisdom to develop, we need the fourth jhana to be in effect. The fifth, the space jhana, the sixth jhana, the seventh jhana, the eighth jhana. We're talking about going really high into psychic abilities um, to the point where you can talk to beings in heaven. You can fly. You can you can you can uh, morph. You can disappear. You can go through mountains, as Buddha would say. And this sounds far fetched um, in the scientific world, but you're starting to see that there is this possibility because if the mind become, if the chitta becomes fully concentrated, fully steady um, and focused, there's also finer and more subtle states of mind that are achieved later on in, in the higher, I wouldn't say higher, but in the sixth, seventh, eighth jhana, to, uh, just to have structure of conversation. So in other words, if the body has the ability to disappear, to vanish, right, as the rishis and buddhas and sages of past were able to do. And I believe there are many that can do it right now on this earth. Yes. Okay. So so um, I'm not saying I know. I'm not saying I've seen. I'm not saying any of those. I'm just, it's just a belief. Um, simply because I understand that mind, when harnessed, can can do many, many things. Now, one thing um, that's really interesting here is that once the mind has been released from the five aggregates or released from ignorance, in other words, released from the cycle of the of 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 the three worlds, the cycle of birth and death, the cycle of uh, um, birth, um, birth, old age, sickness, and death. Once it's released, that is, it's no, no longer clinging or craving form of any kind or no form or any kind or subtle or subtle form of kind like in the in the terms of uh the higher heavens of where it's just pure consciousness there's no form there's no real form right once the mind is released from this complete state who knows how that manifests only mm -hmm. one who you know so when we talk about um you know they spoke to the buddha masters and this and that and people will say, well, they're gone, they're dead, they're, they're, they're in Nibbana. Okay, explain to me what that is. You know, so we don't, we don't know unless, unless you're able to release the mind. Now, if someone has the potential and focus and all the parami to release the mind, imagine the potential. Imagine the potential. It's huge. Mm -hmm. So what, they can't, from Nibbana, they can't talk to people on earth and things like this of course they can they've reached the highest potential possible they've merged completely with 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 uh with 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 no self that is a, it, there's no identity anymore it's chitta chitta in what we call mind in mind or chitta in chitta right so so when people talk to buddha relics and they they think uh you know is it possible that Buddha would talk through the relics. Is it possible that, that Buddha would talk to me? Well, hang on. They've reached the highest state there is. Mm -hmm. Of course it's possible. It's you know, for me, yeah. You know, for me as a, as a uh, medical doctor, I have to say for me, the relics, you're right. You, 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 you really disengage from form. There was no brain here. There is no form and no body, no flesh and bones. And you, you know, I really went back to the drawing board that this is not about a brain anymore. So this is fantastic. And the second thing is that, what, what is the lesson? Why would Buddha even live, leave these relics in his ashes? Because you see, our consciousness right now, and I, I'll speak for myself, is my education is a heavy burden. I have learned so many layers of stuff and it's always form. This body, this nerve, this muscle, this eye, this tongue, this measurement, this color, this weight, this temperature. And, and, and here we're saying you have to drop constraints, you have to drop space, you have to drop time, you have to drop all of those things. As, as Mark was saying, it's instantaneous. And so for me, it really opened up 
actually a joy of science. And I would say my consciousness could fly a little bit because you're getting a taste just a little bit. And I think Buddha's intention is it gives us a little way home because the mind shifts around the relics. I can tell you, having seen thousands and thousands of people now and being myself in the relics, not only in my home, from Minneapolis in my home, and then having had the opportunity, the luck really, to give this meaning and to go to the next tour and another tour, if I could go, I would fly there. And to be uh, in the presence of that, the mind shifted every single time. And what do I mean by the mind shifted? It just became quiet. All the rubbish left. For a good of while, course. the rubbish left. Well, of course, because when, uh, and, and I think we'll end on this note. Uh, we've been going for a while, so and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll go to put into the next, to the next discoveries in the next videos but you see you got to consider one thing when the mind becomes this is why there's eight factors in the noble path right there's not one factor which is just concentration the other one is sati which is being aware um, of what the body is being aware of your feelings being aware of chitta being aware of phenomena but also not abide uh, abiding not clinging to anything in the world now, that has to be like an intention, like an awareness, like a, a guard at the gate. But you've also got concentration. Sure. Now, what happens when the mind becomes steady? It, by default, dislodges from a lot of stuff. It no longer starts to go out through the sixth sense basis. Yeah. It starts to converge on itself automatically. Mm -hmm. so, there's an, so they say that a deep state of samadhi, right, is where it's kind of like a, a state of extinction, mm -hmm. right? Where you're almost like there's nothing completely there. And so people make the conclusion, there's nothing, there's nothing. And the Buddha said, no, 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 that's just the state. You need to go, you need to develop more wisdom. You still haven't hit wisdom faculty yet. But yeah, people do go through this where they reach a state where uh, in their concentration where it seems like there's just nothing. There's just nothing because the mind becomes so focused so stable, so steady, that it completely cuts off everything just naturally. However, without wisdom, without sati, without awareness, the mind still can't because it's still in a state of one point and it's still not, it has to change gears and go into analyzation and has to change gears to go into wisdom faculty. So getting the mind steady is step one. Then two is engaging into wisdom faculty mm -hmm. and getting the wisdom faculty to shine, which is beyond, beyond, beyond. So right. on that note, so on that note, I think we'll finish today's video. Uh, it's been about 40 minutes already. Uh, and thanks, thanks, Nish, Dr. Nisha, for joining me again. Thank you, Mark, for joining me again. I'm honored to be in both your presence and to have this time with you. And I hope that the viewer um, gets a lot of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to discuss a lot of difficult things. We're going into areas that uh, the discussion uh, has to be made and there's not enough discussion in this area. And as you can see, um, uh, like what Dr. Tiller did, you know, very few people in the world even know that such a doctor existed and tried such a thing. And very few people in the world even know about uh, Buddhism, about the Noble Eightfold Path, and also the Buddha relics. So this is what we're talking about uh, right now. All right, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Bye. Take good care. Thank you.